We're in the uh, middle of a, a sermon series, a family series, called um, This Is, or I'm sure, sorry, called Me and My Real, and if you notice on the logo there, the, the perfect is, is, is scratched out, but Me and My Real Family, and I love that title because there is, there is this I, very much an ideal that we try to strive for as families. Um, whether our family is a, a family of one, it's a, a single adult home, or, or a family of more than one, there is, there's, there's definitely a, an ideal that we shoot for, but then al- always comes this, this real sometimes. And the real doesn't always match up with, with the ideal. The, the ideal, is, maybe in your family, is that the, the, the ideal is hopefully that we always get along. The, the real is that we argued all the way to church this morning. Or the ideal is we have a, uh, a family dinner together every, every night at home. The real is that we drove through Chick-fil-A four times this week. Uh, but that was okay because it's a Christian company and so it counts as a, as a good thing that we're doing. The ideal is, is we pray and read our Bible together as a husband and wife. And the real is, is that we fell asleep in front of the couch and we have no idea how the kids got to bed. Um, the, the ideal is we don't need the approval of others, but the real is, is that we're constantly checking our social media to see who's liked our latest photo or post or see who's, who's commented. Um, the ideal is, is that we, we get along with our parents. The real is, you know, I'm not sure that my parents get me. The ideal is I've, I've got this. I'm in control. The real is that my life is, is chaotic. The ideal is is that I'm happy with my life. The real is I'm anything but happy right now. The ideal is life is good and and things are under control. The real is is I can't stop worrying. The ideal is I'm rested and I'm ready to go. The real is I haven't slept in weeks. I'm in a fog and I can't get out of it. I don't enjoy things like I used to. I don't want to get out of my bed. I'm afraid of the future. I can't shut my mind off. I don't know what to do. The ideal is my relationship with God is growing. It's flourishing. The real is I don't even know if God is is there. The The ideal is I'm okay. The real is I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what you know about anxiety and depression. I'm sure you've all heard of that. Uh, most of you have heard those terms before, and if this, the statistics are true, several of you in here have experienced anxiety or depression or, or have gone through that in your life uh, or going through it, and oftentimes the two, the two kind of go hand in hand. Uh, 2015, around 16.1 million adults aged 18 years or older in the U.S. had experienced at least one major depressive episode in the last year which that represents about 6.7% of all, um, all American adults. Depression is the leading cause of disability in the United States among people ages 15 to 44. Anxiety disorders, they're the most common mental illness in the U.S., affecting 40 million adults in the United States ages 18 and older, which is roughly 18.1% of the population every year. And the worldwide estimates are 264 million people live with anxiety, 322 million people live with depression. And when I just say depression or I say anxiety, I'm not talking about just being sad or, or anxiety, you know, you worry a little bit. Um, depression or a major depressive disorder is a is common, serious medical illness that negatively affects how you feel, the way you think, and how you act. It's definitely treatable, and depression causes feelings of sadness and or a loss of interest in activities once enjoyed. It can lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems and a decrease in a person's ability to function at work and at home. Um, Anxiety disorders, people with anxiety disorders frequently have uh, intense, excessive, and persistent worry about worry and fear about everyday situations. Often anxiety disorders involve repeated episodes of sudden feelings of intense anxiety and fear or terror that reach reach a peak within within minutes, um, also known as panic attacks. These feelings of anxiety uh, and panic interfere with daily activities, are difficult to control. Sometimes they're, a lot of times they're out of proportion to the actual danger and can last, last a long time. You may avoid places or you may avoid situations or even 
people so that you try to prevent these feelings. So when, when I'm talking about anxiety and, and, and depression, I, I want you to know that the, that's the type of thing that I'm talking about. And I realize that today, like I said, the truth it probably is that there are some of you in here that might be going through this or know someone who's going through this or have gone through this. And so this, this, this may, the things that I'm going to say may not, may not be easy for you to hear. And some of you might be thinking, okay, wait a minute. I thought this was a family series. So I came here to learn how to be a better parent, be a better husband or wife, or, or teach my kids how to behave or, or whatever. Why are we talking about this? Well, we're talking about this because many families in our city and many families in our church um, are, are dealing with this. And one of the difficulties of anxiety and depression, along with other mental illnesses, is that they don't get talked about. We don't talk about them. They don't usually show up on our prayer lists. Uh, families and individuals that are fighting these battles are usually fighting alone. So I think it's, I think it's important that as a church, we, ad- we address this, and especially as our church family, we address these things. We talk about these very real issues that are affecting the people that are in this building uh, and, and, and people that are affected by people that are, that are affected, people that we know that are close family. And I want you to know that, that this morning, this talk isn't, it's, it's, it's pastoral in nature. It's not, it's not clinical. Some of you know that I, I, I did counseling. I have my license. And, and so I don't want you to walk away thinking this is five ways to feel better. That's not, this isn't a clinical talk. This is, this is more about the, the truths of, of God for us in the midst of our struggles. How God can help us get through what we're going through. So Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through seven, I said earlier, this is Paul writing this letter to the church in Philippi. Um, it's a church that he helped start, a church that he loves. I mean, I, I, he loved all the churches that he started. But there's some things going on within the church that he's addressing in this letter, um, some things that, that have caused some division, some things uh, that, that's happening to them. And um, so he wants to comfort them because it's obviously that they are experiencing the opposite of comfort. They're experiencing worry. Uh, Philippians 4, verse, chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I, I realize that, that Paul was not addressing mental illness directly in that passage. But the principles in that passage are extremely, to me, I think, applicable to someone who is dealing with anxiety or depression or for someone who is walking with someone who is going through those struggles. And I will tell you this, it was, it was a passage that I quoted hundreds, and I'm not exaggerating there, hundreds of times during my bouts um, with, with an anxiety disorder. Um, some, of you, some of you know this, um, but, it, it's a, but a part of my story is that I've had two uh, overwhelming experiences with, with anxiety. And I would probably say depression, too, in there, because like I said, a lot of them, a lot of times they go hand in hand. But for me, anxiety was, was kind of the, the overarching issue. The first time happened when, in the year 2000, um, and I, I dealt with the anxiety for about a year. And then the second time was in 2009. Uh, when I was uh, when I left staff here, on the first time I was on staff here as youth minister, when I left here to actually pursue my uh, degree in counseling, <laughs> funny there irony there, huh? But um, and I and so that was about that was about a gosh a eight ten month uh, journey for me dealing with it. And, and both both times they, they were so they were so similar. Both times my mind was was always racing. Um, I could never I could never quiet it down. I never could. It's like you couldn't stop. It's like someone had stepped on the gas pedal in your car, right? And but your car's in neutral. It's not going. It's just spinning. Um, I, I couldn't quiet my mind. It was. I had a hard time going to sleep. Uh, I would lay in my bed wishing that I could go to sleep. I just stare at the ceiling. Um, sometimes I would get up and I would just walk around uh, because I couldn't go to sleep. I worried about not being able to sleep. I worried about going to bed and at nighttime. Was one of my was one a, a time that I really was afraid just because I knew what was going to happen when I would lay down. I wouldn't be able to go to sleep, so I, I worried about going to sleep, and I couldn't sleep, worried about couldn't going to sleep. I, I worried, um, I, I had several panic attacks. Have you ever had a, a, a panic attack? It feels like your, your, uh, your heart starts racing. Um, you, you get real sweaty. Um, you, it, it kind of feels, I, I've never had one, um, knock on wood, but if, I felt like I, was, I thought I was having a heart attack. 
Um, and, and I remember the first time I had one back in 2000, and we were, we were on a mission trip. We are in the tail end of a mission trip, and we were just walking through the city. Of, we were in downtown Denver. We'd gone to a suburb of Colorado, um, and we were in Denver. We'd just eaten dinner, and we were making our way home, and we were walking, and I just remember this thing. Just, and I'd never experienced this before, ever. I'd never had this issue in my life, ever. And so it just, it just came over me, and I can just remember this cloud just kind of just settling over me. And I started feeling the symptoms of this panic attack. And I, we were downtown, so I just sat down, and I, I laid down on the bench because I didn't know what I really did. I thought I was having a heart attack. I thought I was going to die. And a policeman came, and he said, sir, you can't nap there. So I was like, dude, I'm not napping. I, I told him what was going on. So I don't know what's going on. And so he, he radioed an ambulance, and they came, and they checked me out. Vital, everything, was, everything was good. And, um come to find out that's it was uh, definitely a, uh, a panic attack but then that got me that really kicked off the whole worrying I worried about dying all the time I was afraid I was going to die um, I know that was coming for me obviously one day but I was afraid I was afraid of that I, I would check my my pulse constantly uh, it's, it's really I don't know why this manifested with me but I would check it and if it was going really fast I would worry but since I was already worried, it was already fast. And so it would just send me into this cycle, right? So I'm checking. I would worry that, that it, was, it was going fast. And it would, it would cause more ang- anxiety. Um, I couldn't... I, I worried about a lot of different things. That there, I couldn't watch certain TV shows. Um, I couldn't watch the news because the news was just filled with... Just like now, it was filled with bad stuff. But when you're going through this, it's kind of amplified. And so I couldn't watch certain TV shows. I couldn't watch the news it all worried me. I didn't enjoy things. I worried about worrying. Um, I, I was always afraid that I was going to feel this way, that I would never not feel this way. I couldn't enjoy my family. Physically, my body would, would ache sometimes. Um, I would feel hot, like my body was like on fire on the inside. I, it, would just, it would just happen. Um, and I didn't, um, you know, it was just, it, I didn't feel comfortable in my own skin. Um, when I would go to sleep, I would get to fall asleep I, I wouldn't stay asleep very long but maybe about an hour or so and then when I would wake you wake up and you're kind of like sitting there and then you feel it just kind of all crawl back up on you and then you're you know then you're just like oh man um and so it, my wife tried to help Shonda she tried to help me but there, really there wasn't anything that she could do I mean, she didn't really totally understand what I was going through she did all she could, and she was super supportive through the whole thing, but you, you just feel all alone in that, and it was, it was a horrible feeling, and, and it was a feeling that you, you kind of just felt all the time, and, when, and, and I realized saying those things, for some of you, that may be your reality now, and so I'm not, that wasn't meant to re-traumatize you, but that's just meant to help people, just that's my story, and that's just meant to help people who don't know what's going on sometimes to help them know and when you're struggling like that, whether it is anxiety or it's depression, sometimes th- those take you down um, unhealthy paths that are a result of what you're going through. And, and, those, and these were paths that, that I definitely walked along. Um, these aren't in any, they're not in any order, and, and this by no means is in, in an exhaustive list, but I, just, I, I think these are important to talk about because, number one, I want to normalize these things. In other words, if you feel these things, it's not because you're a freak or it's not because you're going crazy. It's just because you're going through something. Your body, your mind is going through something. And these are realities of what you're going through. And I I want it not only to normalize it, but just to help other people know like, okay, I didn't realize this was what people were going through. I didn't realize this is what people might be thinking. I didn't realize this is what people might be suffering through. And so I, I just kind of want, hopefully these paths, I, I want to illuminate these so we can better understand and we can also know how to better encourage people who are struggling. And the first one on, on the list is, is shame. Um, that, that's, a, that's a big one for a lot of people who are going through mental illness. In a nutshell, just shame says that I'm bad. I'm bad. Not, not that something bad is happening to me, but that I'm bad. I'm broken. There's, there's something wrong with me. And the question becomes, why is, this, why is this happening to me? What did I do wrong? What, 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 why, did this, why did this happen to me? And, and you don't really want to talk about it because, one, you don't really know how to describe it. You, you, and it, it's not something that people can see. It's not like a broken arm or something like that. You know, mental illness, anxiety, depression, that's, that's, in, your, that's in your head and, and no one can see there. So you get worried, a little worried about what people are going to think, what people are going to say. People are going to look at you different, and people are going to wonder, are you, are you going crazy? Or, or people will be like, well, you know, why, why, are you, why are you worried? Snap out of it. Or why are you always so sad? Snap out. You know, you just, 
You don't know what people are going to think. You don't know what people are going to say. So you, you, you try to put on a, a happy face and you act like things are, everything is okay. Uh, but when you feel shame, it's, it's just this, you don't, you just think that you are bad. And, and, and it's, it's kind of a lonely, it's a kind of a lonely feeling. And it, it's a bad feeling. And, and it often causes you to do uh, one of the worst things that, that you should ever do when you're going through anxiety or, or depression. And that's to, to isolate yourself. Uh, isolation is, is another path that people go down because of, because of that. They, they don't want to talk about it. They don't know how to talk about it. They're afraid of what people will say. Part of their fear and part of what they're dealing with is sometimes people and situations, and so they retreat back and they retreat away. And um, you, you try to, sometimes you try to make, make like everything's okay, but you get tired of it, and so you feel really alone. Even when you're with people. I can remember times where I was with people, uh, but I couldn't enjoy people. I didn't enjoy being there. I just felt, I was just in my mind, I was going through all this, and so I knew there was conversation, and I knew there were things going on around me, but I just wasn't present. I was present physically, but mentally, emotionally, I just wasn't there, and, and, and I just, I, I, didn't want, I didn't want to be there. And one of the things that people don't always think about either is um, the, the loved ones who are walking with this with someone, like uh, Shonda, my wife, um, she, you talk about isolation, she felt really isolated and alone um, because one, she didn't really know how to help me or what was going on with me. Number two, she was pregnant with, with Logan, uh, our second child, and so she's just like, okay, my husband is kind of He's going through this, and I don't know what this is, and I don't know where this is going to end up, and so there's a lot of, a lot of fear in her, and, and she doesn't really feel like she can talk about it um, because, again, the, the, not ashamed here, but just kind of what are people going to think? What are people going to say? Jimmy's on staff at a church. What are, what are the church people going to think about him? What are the church people going to say about him if, if they all find out? And so there's, there's this, this lonely place where, where, where family members can be, and especially, it, too, if you're parents and, and your kids are going through this, because then as a parent, you're like, okay, what, did I do something wrong? Why is my kid going through this? I, I, I must be a, a horrible parent. I, I don't want to say this out loud, because then they're looking, well, what's going on in your home? Why is your ch child so sad? Why is your child worrying? What are you not doing correctly? So a lot of times, the isolation doesn't just really happen to the person who's going through, who has a mental illness. A lot of the isolation happens within the family, too. And so there, there is, you pull away, and you pull away from things you enjoy, and if you're going through anxiety, depression, you, you, you want to, a lot of times you want to be alone, but the problem with being alone is all you have is your thoughts, and your thoughts are doing you no favor because all you're thinking about is how you feel and how you don't want to feel that way anymore. I can remember wishing that it would go away, and the more that I wished it would go away, the worse I felt like that it got, because you don't want to think about it. You're trying not to think about it, but that's all you think about. It's like if I told you, don't think about an elephant right now. It's the first thing you think about. You think about an elephant, right? Because I said it, and so that's, that's just kind of the, the, the circle that was happening. You don't want to feel bad, and you wish you wouldn't feel bad, but that's all you think about, and so you're just thinking. And when you're, iso when you're in isolation, you know, when you isolate yourself from people, um, which is a very understandable thing to do when you're feeling what you feel, but then that's all you have is you have your thoughts. And those thoughts lead us down to another, another path, which is this whole idea of distorted thinking. That's another path that, that people who are, who are suffering um, get on sometimes. And your thinking really becomes extreme thinking. Uh, and I don't mean extreme like in a good way. I just, like, like there's, there's no longer any in-between. It's, it's either all good or it's all bad. Or you, or you start thinking in, in worst-case scenarios. Or, or you make big things, uh, or you make things that, that, that aren't big, you make them big. Or, or, and and they, you get it all out of proportion. You start comparing um, to your, your life to other people. You, you start assuming that things about yourself that are true aren't true anymore or you start assuming things that aren't true are true one of the worst things uh, for me was social media um, I would sit there and I would just scroll through social media uh, and, and I would just look at all the people that were in my mind that were that were happy all the people that in my mind had their life together all the people that in my mind were, were at peace and I was just saying, why can't that be me? Why can't that be me? It's never going to be me. Um, I'll always feel this way. Why do I feel this way? And that's, that's one of the social media kind of magnifies things for people who are going through um, some of this. And, and you, you want to be happy, but you look, feel like everyone else is happy. And sometimes you think, well, maybe I don't deserve that happiness. Um, and you're always just wondering, will I feel that way again? 
Or will I always feel this way? Will I always be stuck? So your, your thinking gets all distorted. And, and always and never, when it comes to, when, you, when your thinking is distorted, become really dangerous words because those always and never can lead us to hopelessness. And hopelessness is a, is a dark, it can be a dark path. We've been singing about hope and our hope in, in Christ, uh, but sometimes when you're, when you're going through this, you, you start to lose hopelessness. You feel like things are, are never going to change, that things are never going to get better. You're, you're never going to get relief. Um, hopelessness is, is often what, what leads people to, to take their own life. Um, our, our news feeds, you know, on social media, you, you can see stories after stories about people, kids, adults who are doing that. You know, you read about it in, in newspapers. And, and honestly, sometimes I, I think people who, who make that choice, it's not that they, they, they don't, it's not that they want to die. It's just that they don't want to live the way that they're living anymore. And that's, in their mind, that's the, that's the only that's the only choice that they feel like they have. Um, and, and I just want to stop right there and just for a second and just say, listen, if, that's, if you're on this path, if you feel like you're on this hopelessness path, then you need to, you need to talk to someone. Come talk to me. Um, because I, I know, well, I don't know, but you might be thinking that there is no other way. You might be thinking that there is no hope. But like I said, with our distorted thinking, we forget truths or we stop believing in truths, we stop believing in things. And so what, what we need is someone to come alongside you and to remind you of those things. And so if that's, if that's you, if you're on that hopelessness path, I hope that you would talk to someone, talk to me. Um, I did this in the first service, I'll do this in the second service. Raise your hand if you'd be willing to talk to someone, to encourage someone, to love on someone, to pray with someone. Raise your hand if that would be you, okay? So if you're not... You're not, that's, that's one of the lies I think a lot of times that we believe, and I, and I don't mean that language, but it's just one of the untruths that we believe is that we're all alone, and there is no one else. No one else will help, no one else, and that's so false. And so if you're on this path, um, let someone know, because um, there's people that care about you. There is, there is a way, there is a hope, there is a way out. People love you, and I know this is a dark path, but there is, there is hope. And I can, I, for me, I never got to the point where I would, I would say that I wanted to end of things, but I definitely had the thoughts where I would say, um, I don't know if I can handle this, if, if this is going to be my life for the rest of my life, uh, and, you know, and so you just kind of, you, you get to those places of hopelessness, and, and another path that you get on sometimes when you're going through these struggles is this feeling of de- detachment, you feel detached from God. Um, I remember not really being able to read my Bible, um, I didn't want to. It was, just, it was just words on a page. Uh, I didn't really want to pray. I didn't honestly really know what to pray. I didn't know if God was listening. Um, I knew that he was, right? I knew in my head that he was, but in my heart, sometimes it was hard to, uh, to believe that. And so you, you go back to Philippians 4, 6 through 7, and this was a passage that I held on to. And, and I anchored myself. I, I guess uh, uh, the best way to describe it is like I, I put a, a pair of handcuffs on, on, on me and on this verse. Because I said, I'm, this is, I'm going to carry this everywhere with me. Because I don't feel it right now. And I, sometimes I'm not sure that I believe it. But I, I, I'm just, this, I just know that I've got to hang on. I've got to hang on to that. And I would pray it. Um, because here's the deal. And... and, and this is what we need to know. The peace that passes all understanding, it's real. Whether I was believing it or not, or whether I was experiencing it at that time or not, it was real. It's a promise from God, and it was something that I wanted badly. And when, you, when you're on those paths, okay, when you look at your list there, that you, if you wrote them down, when, you, when you're on the path of shame, isolation, distorted thinking, hopelessness, or you're feeling detached from God, you need to, one of the things that we have to remind ourselves is that God is real. He is true. He is in control. And nothing has or nothing will ever change that. And, and because he's real, because he's true, because he's in control, that means that he's going to provide for you exactly what you need in order to go through what you're going through. And that's, that's what happened to me. That's, that's my story. Now, there wasn't a, a miraculous healing where one day it was lifted. Um, I know God can do that, and I know God has done that, but that wasn't, that wasn't my experience. My experience was, was more of just kind of God's faithfulness in moment by moment, kind of hour by hour, day by day, 
where it led me from feeling like there was this giant elephant on my chest all the time to where then I started experiencing God's peace. And, and I think about it this way, you know, I said the anxiety at its strongest, like I said, just felt like just an elephant was sitting on me. But now I feel like it's more like this, where it's still there. I know it's there, um, but it's, it's manageable. It's, it's, you know, it's got, I, I know the truth, uh, and, and I didn't get there on my own. I got there through, through God loving me and through some, some other things in, in my life. But so I, what I want you to know is my, I, I share my story, but one, because I just, I, I want you, because this may be part of, this may be some of your story. But I also wanted to share my story just so that you know you, these things that I'm about to tell you aren't just things that, that I'm saying because I'm a preacher, man. These things that I'm saying because they're true. And they're true, not because they're my experience, but they're just because they're true. And these can be true for you too. Um, that, God want, that God gives us hope and there are truths that he wants to give us to combat these things that are going on in our lives. And so here's, here's what I would say, kind of the, those are those paths that we go down, but well, here's some of the truths that God gives to us. And the first one is this, is that your value is in Christ. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. That we are his, we are his masterpiece. Um, and I hope you hear that, that, that sentence, that word is, is not a, that, that's, that's a great word, that you are God's masterpiece. And that's not, that's not conditional on how you feel um, or what you do or how you think about yourself or, or what you're thinking or what other people think. That's, that's just true, period. Um, and you know what? You're not ashamed of a masterpiece. You, you proudly put the thing on display, um, you want everyone to see it. Why? Because it's, it's beautiful. Why? Because you're proud of it. Why? Because it brings you joy, because you value it. And here's the thing, that God made, God made you beautiful. And God is, and, and that's not a manly word for you men, so let's just say God made you beautiful. Just get over it. So God made you beautiful. God is, God is proud of you. Um, you bring God joy. God values you. Your sense of worth or value is not tied to your anxiety or to your depression or to your mental or to anything else. Um, your sense of worth or value is not tied to what people might think or what people might say about you. Depression and anxiety, that might be your reality right now, but that is definitely not your identity. Let me say that again. Depression and anxiety, that might be your reality right now, but that is not your identity. That's, that's a hard thing for someone who's going through that to, to kind of separate those two because we feel like that, that my anxiety, my depression, that is me. Um, but, but I think what God will want us to know is that you are his, and right now this is something that you're struggling with. It's, it's, it's a part of your story, but it's, 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 not your, it's not your entire story. It's not your identity. It's not your identity. Your identity is in Christ, and you're a new creation. And let me say this. You have nothing to be ashamed of. You have nothing to be ashamed of. The second thing there I, I would tell you is you're not meant to suffer alone. You're not meant to suffer alone. Galatians 6, 2 says, carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Isolation is not biblical. It's not biblical. I know it's, it's, it's contrary to what we want, especially if, if you're going through something like this. You want to pull away. You, you kind of want to get away. You don't, you don't feel like you can handle the world, and, and, and I understand that part of it. But when you're hurting, God's design is for us to help one another. And one of the best things for me in my story that I ever did was when I was going through my journey was when I started talking about it with people. And I did it slowly. Now, and, and again, I'm not up here going, look, and follow me. Um, but I did it slowly. Um, and and I, I didn't just announce it to the world, but I started out with, with people, with individuals that I know that, that loved me and, and people that I know that I could trust, it, that I could trust. And talking about it made it feel, just for me in my experience, talking about it made it feel lighter. Now, let me, let me, let me stop right there. It didn't make it not heavy because it's still heavy. It's still real. But all of a sudden, when I was talking about it, I didn't feel like I was the only one underneath trying to hold this up. I felt like there were other people trying to carry the load with me. Uh, my wife, she carried the brunt of it for a long, long time. And, and I'll be forever grateful to her for that. 
But, but here's the thing, FBC Allen. If, if we're going to tell people don't walk alone, then we better get our walking shoes on and get ready to walk. Does that make sense? We can't, we can't tell people that it's okay to not be okay and then, then not be there for them. We can't tell them that you're not alone and then leave them alone. We've got to be willing as a church to come alongside people and walk. And one of the greatest ways that we can show the love of Christ to one another and to this world is to be burden lifters for one another. The next thing I would tell you there is that you have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we, we have the mind of Christ. As a believer, you, you have the mind of Christ. And what does that mean? Well, that means that you have the capacity to have the proper perspective about yourself, to know the truth about you. That you don't have to believe all the lies. You don't have to believe the things that are not true, the things, the negative thoughts that you, that you have. You are God's masterpiece. You were created for a purpose. You're loved by Him. You've been gifted by Him. You're a new creation. You're His ambassador. You, you have gifts that this church needs uh, in, in your service. You're forgiven. You're, you have access to God. You're a sinner saved by grace. These things are true, and these things are things you can know and experience yourself. The mind of Christ means that you always have His presence. The mind of Christ means that God is not distant. The mind of Christ means that you are right with God, that you are justified. His love, His death, His resurrection, His forgiveness, it made, it made you right with Him. The mind of Christ means that you are worthy. You are worthy, not because of who you are or not because of what you did, but because of Christ in you. The greatest antidote to our distorted thinking is to remember that we are God's child and all the blessings that come with that. The blessings about purpose, the blessings about uh, value, the blessings of, of hope, the blessings of strength, the blessings of peace, all of that belongs to us because we have the mind of Christ. Next thing there is I would say is that you could get help. You can get help. Deuteronomy 31.3 says, But the Lord your God, He's the one who will cross over before you. He's the one who will destroy these nations before you so you can displace them. Joshua too will cross over before you, just like the Lord indicated. You see, Joshua didn't fight his battles alone. God was fighting for him. God was fighting with him. The people of Israel didn't fight alone. They had Joshua as their leader, and they had God on their side. God was on their side. And here's what we, sometimes we forget um, and, and that God is, is with us and he is fighting for us. God gives us the wisdom to know that we need help. One of the best things for me in my journey was that I, I went to go see a counselor. Um, when I was doing my, going through my master's of counseling, one of the things that they required was is that you go to counseling uh, just so you understand the experience, you know what it's like, and they want you to, to look at your stuff. Because uh, a lot of times there's stuff that we have, but we just don't deal with it, and so we sweep it under the rug. And I will tell you, the first time back in 2000, I didn't, I didn't do counseling, but in 2009, um, I did <laughs> because I was, I was forced to. Um, but I'm glad I did. It was, it was one of the best decisions um, that I ever made because God, it was, it was through going to see a counselor where I learned a lot of things about me, and I saw things. Um, that were going on in me that I didn't realize were going on. Um, the, the counselor helped me to see things I wasn't seeing. Um, my counselor helped me with my distorted thinking, um, reminded me of truths that I had forgotten or truths that I stopped believing, pointed out the lies that I was believing. Um, my counselor humbled me uh, because there was definitely some arrogance in my life. There were some areas in life where I thought, you know, I, I had put myself on a pedestal, and the, the, the counselor reminded me that that's not your place, that's God's place. My counselor helped me, helped me remember what my identity was, was who, who I was, where my identity was in, and not in some other things. And God used, God used this counselor to help me to find hope again. I used my counselor to, to battle with me and to battle for me. And, and my counselor helped me to see that God was, was there the whole time. And so I, I think it's, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to seek help because God uses people. Remember, we don't, we don't suffer alone. We're not supposed to battle alone. But God uses different people to, to see things, to give us perspective, to remind us. Because remember, if, it's, if we don't get help and we just leave it to ourselves, the only thing we've got going in our head are those negative messages. And those negative messages just keep 
rotating and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Think of it as a snowball. A snowball just rolls down the hill and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And sometimes we need someone just to stop in the middle of that and to help us to rethink, to retrain our minds and to start to think differently. And the last thing there I would say is that God wants to comfort you. Psalm 34, 18 and 19 says this, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from, all, from them all. I felt detached. And I tried to think of a different word there, but that was just... Distant might be another word, but I, I, I just I, I didn't feel connected. But that was, that was a symptom. That wasn't real separation. Just because I felt that doesn't mean that it was true. The reality was that God was near to me. Distance or disconnection, is, it's, it's, never real, it's never a God issue. It's always an, an us issue. It's, it's a symptom of what we're going through. God knows our hearts. He knows our concerns. He knows what's hurting us. He knows our thoughts. He knows our fears. He knows us, and He wants to comfort us. And He meets us right where we are, right in the middle of, of that mess, right in the middle of what we're going through, to let us know that He knows, to let us know that He loves, to let us know that He cares. The same God who in Genesis said, let there be light and created light, just in, in, it didn't exist and He created it. That's the same God that wants to, wants to bring light into your dark spaces. So, back to Philippians 4. Six through seven. Don't worry about anything. Don't be anxious. But the assumption there is that they were. They already were. And so Paul addresses that. But here's what you do instead. In everything through prayer and petition. That term there is it's this heartfelt, it's 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 deep, it's 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 a, like a desperate request. With thanksgiving. So you're asking in desperation, but you're also asking with thanksgiving, thankful for who God is, thankful for his promises, what he says about himself, what he says about you, what he promises to do for you and for me, and for what he says is true about you and me. Present your requests to God. Give them over to him. Let go of them daily, hourly, moment. Give them, give them to the King of kings. Give it to the Lord of lords. Give it to the God who defeated death in the grave. Give them to the creator of the universe. And here's what he'll give back to you. Okay, this is not, this is not a maybe. This is, this is a promise that he'll give back to you. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. And I love that phrase. It's like, it's like a century standing at the gate. Or, you know, just think about the, just the, our, the world's military. Just, you know, just think about our military. Just stand, it's just guarding your heart and your mind. That's what God's doing. He will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, the source of our hope, the source of our peace, the one who calms that storm when we feel overwhelmed. God is, God is fighting for you. And I hope that you don't ever forget that.